Hey, welcome back to part eight. In a constituency meeting, delegates transact business. This includes not only determining who by vote will be the leaders in the conference, that is the election of conference officers, but it also means deciding on changes in the constitution and bylaws and other items. We're going to talk about the constitution and bylaws next time in part nine. Today I'm sharing suggestions which might be useful in a constituency meeting setting. There are occasions when those who are controlling the process in a constituency meeting may attempt to introduce changes which are inconsistent with the truth and mission that God has appointed for his church. The better that lay people understand the constituency meeting, the more empowered they will be to help God's people toward positive outcomes. So let's just leap into this. There are some helpful preparations that you and your congregation can make to prepare for a constituency meeting. Encourage your church board to schedule a meeting in your local church where delegates and members represented can discuss the upcoming constituency session. Pray for yourself and for the other delegates. If you're a delegate, read the information packet. I mean, actually sit down and open it and read it before you get there. Make it a very high priority to get to the constituency meeting before it begins. And you know, remind your congregation to pray during the constituency meeting. Pray that God's spirit will lead hearts and minds. Now, usually the items that you're going to address, the main items in a constituency meeting, those have already been determined by a committee and those are going to come up in their order and the agenda. If you have any motion you want to make, you need to be ready to get up and make your motion at the at the at just the right time. You're not going to be able to obtain the floor at just any time. So I'm gonna flash these on the screen. To obtain the floor is to be recognized by the chair as having the exclusive right to be heard at that time. If you're entitled to the floor, the chair must recognize you. Now don't forget that the chair will also hold speakers to the allotted time and maybe as little as two minutes. Be very careful that you're ready to go. Don't expect to speak to a motion several times. You've got hundreds of delegates there. You'll probably just get to speak once, if once. So to obtain the floor, for example, one might go to the microphone and face the chair and say, you know, John Smith, regular delegate, Lansing Church, and the chair will say, the chair recognizes Mr. Smith. When you have the floor and you're going to make a motion, have the wording of your motion ready. I see a lot of delegates, they write it out on their phone and they read it right off their phone. Or you can write it on a page but have your exact wording ready. Some places they'll want you to actually submit a printed page with your, with your motion right on it. Be near where the mics are. Usually there will be two or three or four mics. One's usually a point of order mic, know where that is. You can give a point of order from any mic, but if you go to the point of order mic, this, the chair will give you preference. So be thinking about that. If you need to have delegate ID ready, have it ready. As soon as your turn at the mic comes, you need to be able to instantly properly identify yourself and jump straight on with whatever you're going to say. Sometimes when you're making a motion, certain kinds of motions are non-debatable. That means you just get to tell what it is and the whole hundreds of delegates have to vote on it then and there. So when you make a motion like that, you better make it a quick, very quick, very brief explanation why you're making the motion and so that the people, because that's all they're gonna get. They're not gonna have any real give and take on it. For example, in a certain case where let's say they wanna vote a bunch of people as a block, you're voting in these people for department positions as a block. You might say something like, uh, Mr. Chair, it is extremely important that the right person serve in these department positions. Those chosen will directly impact how this conference passes through any societal crisis that comes up during this next term. I move that this question be divided so that the department heads are voted on independently. I so move. That's how you do it, real quick, even quicker than that. Always make sure your language is clear, it's precise, it's respectful. Don't accuse anybody of anything. Just be straightforward, plain, and to the point. It'll always be appreciated. So there's something else that happens you might want to be aware of too. At different times during a constituency meeting, the chair, he may make a statement such as, let's take this as a block, or if there are no objections, or if there's no objection, or by universal consent, uh, those kind of statements will be made. And those are statements by which the chair is bidding the group, you know, I want to bypass the regular processes. And usually that's innocent. Usually there's no reason not to do it. Uh, there's some things that just need to be addressed and need to be addressed very quickly. There's no reason not to take care of this. However, there are times when this could be used in a manipulative way. What this is, it's the assumption that everybody agrees so we can dispense with the regular formalities. And again, like most of the time, that's fine. But keep alert and realize that even if just one person in the assembly objects, he won't be able to proceed with, with just this assumption. It'll have to be voted through. Sometimes you want to make sure that things are happening just according exactly the way they should. Okay, a lot of the action in a constituency meeting is uh, conducted through what's called the main motion. And so uh, there's six steps in the consideration of a main motion. The main motion is kind of the foundation. So let's just get these real quickly here. First of all, a delegate obtains the floor and makes a motion, or maybe there's a motion already on the floor that's being considered, and maybe you're gonna move to amend, or you have something to say, I'm in favor of this, or I oppose this because, 
Anyway, you get up there, but if you're making a motion, somebody obtains the floor, they make a motion, it needs to be seconded. The reason it's seconded is just to show there's more than one person who wants to talk about this. If only one person wants to talk about it, why? Then they'll just let it die and move on. Sometimes a motion comes from a committee and a committee has more than one person on it, so it's kind of like automatically seconded. So it's moved, it's seconded. The third thing is that the chair, the chairperson will state the motion, and that's the wording that really matters. So. The person who moves and the person who seconds the motion, they should agree with the chair about the motion, what it is. So then comes debate, and we kind of don't like the word debate. We get kind of queasy around that word because we don't want to go into debates, but debate's just the word that just means it, the matter is discussed and it's looked at pro or con. People say why they're for it. People say why they're against it. Somebody wants to amend it and make it be a little bit different. That's, that's when you do that. That's the debate phase. That's the fourth step. Now, after debate's gone on, if it goes on too long at all, someone will usually say, I call previous question or I call the question, and that's just a way of saying uh, we want to go ahead and stop the debate phase and go ahead and vote on this. It needs two-thirds majority if it's voted on to, uh, to go ahead and that would close debate, no more debate, now it's just an up and down vote gets to be done on it. A lot of times you know the chair will say, it looks like the group's ready to vote, and he'll just say, if there's no objection, we'll go ahead and vote. And then you don't have to go through the process of counting all the votes for a, a call the question kind of a thing. The fifth step is that the vote is taken and then the sixth step would be that the chair announces the result of the vote and that's what that's how a main motion works. Everything's kind of built on that little six step plan there so keep that in mind, keep it clear in your mind. I want to make sure we understand at least two more things. One is that what the whole foundation, the whole principle of parliamentary procedure is all built on this one idea that that one question at a time is addressed. So the whole, all the debate process is going to address one question at a time. That's the first part. The second part is called precedence. And certain motions uh, have precedence over other motions. So look at this little chart here I've put together for you. There's kind of a pyramid there. That means that going up from the bottom level is the main motion. And then you have subsidiary motions. And then you have incidental motions. And then you have privileged motions. The motion that's higher on the list always gets to trump the one that's below it. So usually uh, the subsidiary motions and the incidental motions, those are just things that pertain to a main motion that's on the floor, like you might want to amend it or do something to it. So that's where you have those two. Uh, then you have privileged motions. Usually privileged motion has something to do with uh, time, some kind of a time issue, you know, maybe taking a recess. You know, someone might say, Mr. Chairperson, there's two cars on fire in the parking lot. I move that we take a recess for a couple of minutes. Probably will do that. Uh, that takes precedence over the debate. And then you'll come back to the debate when the recess is over and carry on where you left off. Now keep in mind this chart does not include every possible motion. We'll come back to a few examples of this later on. But I want to go on now and I want to just give you a six or seven of these motions and, and things that can happen that can be maybe especially useful in a constituency meeting setting. So don't just do these. I mean, these you'd only do these if there's a reason and you're not going to do these to try to slow things down or do anything to inhibit the process. You want the process, everybody wants the process to go at an efficient pace. But let's talk about division of the assembly. Division of the assembly. So if a member doubts the result of a voice vote or a show of hands or maybe even a show of cards, he can call for what's called the division of the assembly. And when that happens, I'd say it's, it's just basically saying we're going to take an actual vote. And so people would vote by name. It could be a roll call vote. They might have people stand up and recount them and count the vote more carefully. No votes even required. If somebody calls for division, it just, it's just going to, it just should happen. It doesn't need to be seconded. Any single member can call for a division. So here's a real simple one. You can just do it. Now, if you have electronic voting, which seems to be a lot more common these days, probably this kind of thing isn't going to happen. But if it's non-electronic voting, you could have this. If you thought the result was was that the chair gives was wrong, you could call for division of the assembly. Here's a, another one, division of the question. So when a motion relating to a single subject contains several parts, then you can call for a division of the question, dividing it into its different pieces. So you can vote for each piece separately. Like if you're gonna have several people from several departments and they wanna just vote them as a block, and here's six people, you're gonna vote on all at once. Well, maybe that you think that two of those Six or four of those are real good, and two of them are ones that really shouldn't be appointed to those. You might say, I call for division of the question because these should be handled individually. So then that would be voted on, and if it passes, why then those would be voted on individually. Division of the question. When something, when the chair wants to take something as a block, division of the question takes it back to individual pieces. Now to make a motion like this, you have to have the floor. The motion has to be seconded, and this is one of those that's not debatable. In fact, 
Uh, the privileged motions and the incidental motions are more or less not debatable. Some of the subsidiary motions are debatable. And it'll be divided if you have 50% of more than 50%. Let's talk about nominating committee referral. And this is a place where a lot of times the lay people kind of get boonswoggled by the chair. Uh, and so we should understand this better. So let's say there's an objection to one or more of the people that are brought in by the nominating committee. We want, you know, so-and-so for, for president. And a lot of people are like, no, absolutely not. Shouldn't be that person. So the objectors can re request that the report be referred back to the nominating committee. You're not supposed to state any individual name, but you want to send the whole report back. Now, a lot of times at that point, the chair will say, is that a motion? And that's the tricky spot. Do not fall for this. Don't make it a motion. Because if it's a motion, it's non-debatable and the people are going to vote on it. And like hundreds of people in the room won't know why that's going back. Why don't we want, why don't we want to just take this as it is? So you can't really debate about it. So uh, what you would say is, uh, no, Mr. Chair, I am, I am asking that this be referred back to the nominating committee. I am not making a motion. I'm not intending to make a motion, but I know that it's normally that if it's sent back, that you would send it back and I'm asking you to send it back. That's what you do with a referral. Now, again, a lot of times the chair will say, so is that a motion? And some person without thinking, and they'll say, oh, it's a motion. And as I, as I said, you know, that's a way to get it defeated right away. And now you wind up, you're stuck with that person's voted on and nobody knows why not to. So if you have an issue, do not make it a motion when you send a referral back to the nominating committee. Ask for it to be returned to the nominating committee. And if the chair doesn't want to send it back, you could have several people that maybe if you feel the same way, you need to go up one by one and say, uh, Mr. Chair, I, I want to ask that this this report be referred back to the nominating committee. There's names there that shouldn't be there. Please refer this back. No, this is not a motion. This is a request. <laughs> don't be boonswoggled by that. Don't, don't let the chair, don't let the union president or whoever it is, don't let them uh, sneak you into getting that person in like that. You know, even if the assembly doesn't realize why there's a problem with that name, if they recognize there's an undercurrent of dissatisfaction, you know, there's a lot of people that are unhappy with that, they'll be more interested in sending it back to the, referring it back to the nominating committee. So that's a nominating committee referral. Let's look at another one. And you see this whenever there's a general conference session, it's called the point of order. Also, sometimes it's called the point of information. If you believe that the rules of the assembly are being violated in some way, some kind of process that should be happening isn't happening, you can call a point of order. Point of order is kind of at the top of the pyramid almost there on our little chart. It has precedence over almost every, anything. And here's how the point of order works. Uh, you might say, uh, go to the point of order, Mike, and you can interrupt if somebody else is speaking even, uh, you would say, Mr. Chairperson, I have a point of order. And he kind of, everything will probably stop right at that point and you'll, you'll be looked at, the chair will say, go ahead, uh, so-and-so, you need to identify yourself again. Uh, I'm brother so-and-so delegate from such and such. And you give your reason why you're making the point of order. The point of order doesn't take a second and the point of order is not debatable. The chair is going to hear your point of order. He may consult with his parliamentarian or he may not, but he's going to, what the chair does is he's going to rule on your point of order. He may agree with it, he may sustain it and, and agree with it and cause something to be changed so that things are right. He may disagree with it and say, no, we're going to carry on and go this way, showing that you know he's going to keep on. And so he may, after he states his reason and makes his ruling, at that time you have a decision to make. If he's given a, a fair response, if his ruling is good, you need to just agree with it and be done and sit down. If, however, he makes a, his, his reasoning is wrong, if, if he's not doing what he should be doing, you can say, uh, I, you can say, Mr. Chairperson, I'm afraid I'm going to have to appeal. And that takes us to our next one called the appeal to the point of order. So an appeal to the point of order works like this. Um, the, the, the chairperson has the authority to make a ruling. He's made a ruling. You disagree with the ruling. You think it's wrong. And now what you're going to do is you're going to, if your motion passes, uh, the appeal, then it's going to take the authority to make that decision. It's going to either, your, the group is going to be able to agree with the chair or disagree with the chair. So here's how the appeal works. It takes at least two members, a mover and a seconder. It has to be moved. It has to be seconded. The appeal, you would say, well, I appeal that. And then if there's no second, your appeal will die. But if it's seconded by at least one person, then it's a live motion. And what you're doing is you're appealing the decision that the chairperson has made and you're appealing to, and you're going to send it back to the assembly. Now you can't do this 10 minutes later or 20 months later. It's gotta be done at the very time when the ruling was made. So when voting on the appeal, the chairperson will state his question like this. Shall the decision of the chair be sustained? So a majority or a tie vote sustains his position if less than 50% 
agree, then his position is overturned and his ruling goes away. That's how it works. So this is where the whole assembly can take take the ruling of the chair and take that authority from the chair and they themselves decide whether they agree with it or not. Appeal to a point of order. This won't, won't commonly happen, but it's one thing you can do if you didn't feel like you were served justice when you made the appeal. By the way, I've noticed that uh, chair people are pretty slow to want to do the appeal thing. So you have to be pretty firm and you have to be uh, respectful, but you may need to explain it so the people around know what's going on. If, if they turn off your mic and say you're done, you're going to be you're going to be in a world of hurt as far as getting that done. So uh, be concise, be respectful, be clear, tell what you want to happen and even explain to the assembly just in one line, you know, uh, since I'm making an appeal, this would this is what should happen next, Mr. Chair. So here's another, another motion called suspend the rules. It may be useful for the assembly to address an item in a different order than it's on the agenda. And you could suspend the rules if the, if the group agrees to and take something in a different order than it would have been done otherwise. If somebody else has the floor, you can't make a motion to suspend the rules. When you do make a motion to suspend the rules, it has to be seconded. It's non-debatable, so you're not gonna be able to give a big explanation, a lengthy explanation about why. Usually it takes two thirds. Two thirds have to agree with you to suspend the rules. A lot of times two thirds will say, well, why should we suspend the rules? By the way, this motion cannot be used to suspend the bylaws, which is our subject on number nine next time. We're gonna talk about constitution and bylaws. Okay, so let's look at lay on the table or to table something. This is a motion that's often abused and I'll give you a case where we all remember it was abused here just a few years ago. A really amazing case. But let's talk about the motion. When somebody says, I move that we lay this on the table, or I'm, well, let's table this, what this does is it enables the assembly to set aside a motion uh, for later, and this is often used, illegitimately, I might add, it's often used to kill a motion. And the only time this uh, uh, motion to table is in order is when something else extremely urgent has come up. Most of the time, that's not the case. And so most of the time, this is used incorrectly. So this motion, the effect it has is to immediately stop any debate on the motion, Somebody has to have the floor to make this motion. It has to be seconded and it can't be debated. It's non-debatable. It's just a yes or a no vote. A question that's voted to be laid on the table stays there until it's brought back or else when the session is in it, it just basically dies. So this is a kind of a pocket veto. This is a way to get rid of something you don't want. It's a way to, it's an illegitimate way to kill a motion. There's other motions that can be made to postpone indefinitely. There's things like that. But to table something is often it's misused. Robert's rules here will even tell you this is often misused. And there was quite an egregious case of misuse, just amazing case, all happened publicly. You might remember it back in the 2017 North American Division year in meeting. Do you remember that? So in that meeting, one of the delegates offered a motion to uh, have the North American Division abide by the decision of the General Conference session in 2015 not to permit in, in different entities to independently ordain uh, women to the gospel ministry. And one of the delegates, I don't, don't know quite how we got in the building, but one of the delegates uh, voted to do that. And uh, this was kind of an emergency because almost everybody there didn't want to do that. So here's, you might, do you remember what happened? Suddenly there were, they said, let's have an, a pause for prayer. And everybody got into little groups to pray. The camera was still running, and as you might remember, if you were watching that live stream as I was, suddenly there were five officers up front, the North American Division president and, and some general conference guys, and they all got up there, and they had a confab there. And while everybody else was praying, except the photographer, you can see the photographer taking pictures of the people praying. So somebody was praying, praise the Lord. But the leaders were up there going back and forth trying to figure out what to do because this was an emergency. They didn't want to at all even vote on this this kind of a motion. They don't want to go on record as voting against the general conference, right? So I didn't see a single one of those leaders pray. God help them. But after this was over, uh, they all came back together. And then one of those five officers, which was in fact the general conference treasurer of all people, came up and he made a motion and he made some kind of screwy reasoning. But he asked that this motion be tabled. And they went ahead and it was non-debatable, just as I said. They voted and it overwhelmingly passed to table this thing. It was clearly to kill this other motion that was made absolutely out of order. You know what was going on. The majority of the people in that room were adherents. They were worshipers of the golden calf of women's ordination. And they were not willing to stop worshiping their little golden calf. And so 
There we had it. So we should be faithful in any situation, but there's no guarantee that even if you or I are faithful, there's no guarantee that the right ruling will prevail. This was a case where the wrong decision was made, and that's what prevailed. But many people could sleep with their conscience that night, and some perhaps couldn't. By the way, I believe we should remember that kind of behavior with disapproval and reward that kind of behavior that was exhibited by those five officers in 2017. Their, their reward should be, you know, removal from leadership, if not even more, if not censure. Uh, that, was, uh, that was base and treasonous. But anyway, let's talk about tactics. Sometimes a matter comes before the assembly, which a lot of people there are pretty determined that they want that thing to pass. And it may be that it's not a good thing. They wanted to have a yes vote, but a clear trend begins to develop in the hall, and there's clearly strong opposition. And they don't want this thing to just be killed. They don't want the motion to die completely, so they figure out, you know, well, what are we going to do? We're not going to win it today. We don't want it to be to be absolutely killed. So they will. Somebody will stand up and say, "Move to refer it to a committee." And so that kind of thing will happen. That's one of the tactics: is to keep something from dying. They'll say, We're, "I move this be referred back to the X Y Z committee." or I move that this be referred to the executive committee. So that means that in between sessions of the constituency meeting, the executive committee's in charge and the executive committee will make those kind of decisions. So you're moving from a very wide representation in the constituency meeting, which doesn't want it. Now you're moving to a very small group of 15 or 20 or 25 people who are going to decide uh, whether that goes or not. So be very wary about moving an item and just passing it on over to the executive committee. I'd be very careful about letting anything slip out of the hands, of direct hands of the constituency. Now, recently it's become quite common to have at different times in the meeting a pause for prayer uh, before like the consideration of a major item or if, if the uh, feeling in the room begins to get kind of intense, there's some disagreement going on and say, well, let's have, let's have, let's take a few minutes for prayer. We'll get in little groups and huddle and pray. And you know what? A lot of times that's perfectly fine. There's no problem with it. It's, it's a good thing. We, we, we believe, all of us believe in prayer. At the same time, this could be also misused. This could be used in a tactical way. This could be used by people to break up the momentum. If there's a certain thing that's moving in a direction that some people don't want, it can all be brought to a stop by having this call for prayer. And we saw it in the North American Division in the 2017 meeting that I just reminded you about. At that time, they all paused for prayer, and I'm sure many people were quite sincere as they prayed, but some of that people were using that prayer time to plot a treasonous way of getting rid of that motion. And so these calls for prayer, watch out, they could be very legitimate, they could also be abused. Well, before we finish, I want to also deal with one more thing, and that is the um, idea of voting on one name at a time. And I know a lot of us have been dissatisfied. They bring these names. There's only one name brought for the conference president. There's only one name brought for the conference secretary and so on. And you kind of wish that it wasn't that person. For some reason, you, you, you have a reason to think that that wouldn't be the best person. And so we kind of dislike that having just one name. But I want to tell you that it's more consistent with our Christian point of view, actually, to vote on one name at a time. Let me explain that to you. I don't really like this maybe any better than you, but but I think this is the truth, so let me share it to you. This approach of voting on one name is more consistent with our Christian principles than, than you might have thought. Realize this. We are praying all the time that God will intervene. We are praying for our conference officers and leaders. We're praying for our members on the executive committee. We are praying for the delegates. We pray for the churches when they vote to elect their representatives that are going to be the delegates to the constituency meeting. When we get there, we have the organizing committee. They vote for the, the nominating committee. We're praying for them. When the nominating committee is meeting, we are praying for them. And definitely, I'll tell you what, your, your most prayer would be for the nominating committee because the people that are elected are going to affect how things go for a long time. It's very important to get that right. So you're praying for the nominating committee. And then they finally bring a list and they'll probably bring it in pieces. They'll bring out this many names. And later on, they'll bring out this many names and we get to vote on those. So to vote on one name at a time actually makes sense because we believe at each step of the way, we've been praying, we've been seeking, everybody's been seeking for God to intervene. So if God has intervened, why would, uh, why would you get two names? <laughs> uh, that would be, um, be kind of weird. You know, we believe that God is intervening. Now, even if you get one name, but if the majority vote, they don't think that's the name, why that would become very apparent by a, a refusal to vote for that person. So voting on one name at a time, even though you don't probably like it, and I know I don't like it, 
And yet it is consistent with their Christian principles, perhaps more consistent than it would be to have multiple names that you're voting for. So stop and be fair with that. Think about that a little bit. And you might you might kind of be like me and kind of regrettably agree with that. It just seems like we should be voting for multiple names. You know, in the Soviet Union, they voted only for one name at a time because the party said so. You know, the godless communist party said so. We as Christians vote for one name at a time because we believe all along the way that we we know we've been praying for God to intervene for his for his sake, for the sake of his church. So there is, is why we vote for just one name at a time. Keep in mind, there's no guarantee that a certain nominee is, you know, God's candidate, but it's very plausible that that person is the person that God is uh, setting forward to the group to agree that that person's the one they want, the one that is going to fit God's purpose for that position. So friends, I hope you're encouraged. I hope that you feel like you understand some of these procedures just a little bit better than you did before you began to watch this presentation. I want you to be, be encouraged. Remember, God wants his church to succeed. God has not left the constituency meeting just to flounder. Uh, if people will be submitted to God, we'll see God's moving. We'll see some good outcomes in our constituency meetings. So pray hard and be, be engaged and let's let God be God and let's watch and see if he doesn't surprise us with some really good things along the way. Next time, one of the most important things that kind of goes with constituency meetings is constitution and bylaws. You're going to be surprised by what the conferences should have and what they're required to have by the World Church and what a lot of them don't have. We'll talk about that next time. In the meantime, God bless you and God bless your conference in its constituency meeting session. All right, let's try again here.